in the forest was a pretty little fir tree. It stood in a nice airy spot where the sun could get at it, and it had lots of bigger companions growing round it, pines as well as firs. But the little fir tree was in a great hurry to grow up. It thought nothing of the warm sunshine and the fresh air. It didn't give the village children a second look when they went chattering along, looking for wild strawberries and raspberries. Sometimes they'd come with a whole crockful, or they'd have strawberries actually threaded on a straw, and they'd sit down by the little tree and say, Oh, isn't that a dainty little tree? But the little tree didn't like to hear that sort of thing at all. The next year it was bigger by a good stretch, and the year after that it was taller still. And you'd see that by its rings, because fir trees have one for every year they grow. Oh, if only I were a big tree like those others, sighed the little tree. Then I'd spread my branches out wide, and I'd look out from top all over the wide world. The birds would build nests in my branches, and when the wind blew, I'd nod gracefully as the others over there. It took no pleasure in the sunshine and the birds or in the rosy clouds that drifted over it morning and evening. And when winter came and the snow lay glittering white all around, a hare might come bounding along and jump right over the little tree. That was annoying. But two winters passed, and when the third came, the tree was so big that the hares now had to go round it. Oh, to grow, to grow, to get big and old. That was surely the only pleasure in the whole world, thought the tree. In the autumn, the woodcutters used to come and cut down some of the largest trees. It happened every year, and the young fir tree, who was now growing up very nicely, shuddered as the tall, splendid trees fell, tearing and crashing to the ground. Their branches were lopped off, so they looked long and thin and bare. You'd hardly recognise them. And they were loaded onto wagons, and horses pulled them off out into the forest. Where are they going to, then? What would happen to them? In the spring, when the swallows came and the storks, the tree asked them, Do you know where they are taken? Did you meet them? The swallows didn't know anything about it. But a stork looked wise and nodded his head and said, Oh yes, I think I know that. I met up with a lot of new ships when I was flying here from Egypt, and these ships had splendid tall masts, and I fancy that that would be them. They smelt like fur. I must say, I did you proud. Very smart they were, very smart. Oh, how I wish I were big enough to set off over the sea like that. But what's the sea really like? How does it look? Dear me, said the stork, that's far too complicated to explain. And he went away. Enjoy yourself while you're young, said the sunbeams. Enjoy yourself while you're growing, with all that life in you. And the wind brushed the tree with kisses, and the dew covered it with tears, but the fir tree just didn't know what they were up to. When it was nearly Christmas, some quite young trees were cut down, some of them neither so big nor so old as our fidgety fir tree, with all its need to be up and doing. These young trees, and they were altogether the most beautiful ones, kept all their branches when they were loaded onto the wagons, and when the horses pulled them off out of the forest. "'Where are they going to?' asked the fir tree. They're no bigger than me. In fact, there was one who was a lot smaller. Why do they keep all their branches? Where are they taken to? We see it. We see it, twittered the sparrows. We've been peeking in at the windows down in the town. We know where they're taken to. Oh, they get as rich and splendid as you can imagine. We've peeked in the windows and seen how they're planted in the middle of warm rooms and decorated with, with the most beautiful things. Golden apples, honey cakes, toys and hundreds of candles. And then asked the fir tree, trembling through its branches. And then, what happens then? Oh, we've not seen more than that. But that was beyond anything. Then maybe I'll be bound for a splendid trip like that one day, said the tree full of joy. That'll be even better than going over the sea. Oh, how I ache with longing. If only it were Christmas. I'm as tall now and as branchy as the others were who were taken last year. Oh, that I were up on that wagon or in that warm room with all the pomp and splendour, and then, oh yes, something even better will happen, even more beautiful. Why else should they decorate me? Something must happen that's even bigger, even better. But what? Oh, how I ache. How I long for it. I don't, for the life of me, know what's to come over me. Enjoy yourself with me, said the air and the, and the sunshine. Enjoy being young outside in the open air. 
but the fir tree didn't enjoy such things in the least. It grew and it grew. Winter and summer, it stood there all green. All dark green it stood there, and people who saw it said, what a lovely tree. So when Christmas came, it was the first one of all to be cut down. The axe cut deep into its pith, and the tree fell to the earth with a sigh. It fell to pain, a faintness. It couldn't think about being happy. It was saddened to be leaving its home, its place, where it had its roots. Now it knew that it would never again see its dear old friends, the little shrubs and flowers around about, perhaps not even the birds. No joy in parting like that. The tree only came to its senses when it was unloaded in the yard with the other trees, and it heard a man say, That's a beauty. We don't need any but that. So a couple of servants in full livery came along and brought the fir tree into a big handsome room. Portraits hanging all round on the walls and by the big tiled stove stood big Chinese vases with lions on their lids. And there were rocking chairs, sofas upholstered in silk, big tables covered with picture books and toys worth a hundred times a hundred pounds. Well, that's what the children said. And the fir tree was set up in a big tub filled with sand. But you couldn't see that. It was a tub because they hung it round with green bays and stood it on a broad, many-coloured carpet. Oh, how the tree trembled. What was going to happen now? The servants and the young ladies of the house came and decorated it. On one branch they hung little nets, cut from coloured paper, and every net was filled with sweets. Golden apples and walnuts hung down as if they grew there, and more than a hundred red, blue and white candles were fastened among the branches. Dolls, which looked like real people, the tree had never seen such things before, swung among the pine needles, while right at the top there was a big star made of golden tinsel. It was all marvellous, unspeakably marvellous. This evening, said everybody, it'll sparkle this evening. Oh, thought the tree, if only it were evening, if only the candles were lit, and what will happen then? Perhaps the trees will come out of the forest to see me. Perhaps the sparrows will fly to the window panes. Perhaps I shall stay growing here and keep my decorations summer and winter alike. Oh yes, the fir tree knew what was going on. But it was a real barkache from all this longing. And a barkache for a tree is an unpleasant as a headache for the rest of us. And now the candles were lit. Such brilliance, such splendour. The tree trembled through all its branches so much that one of the candles set fire to its needles, very painful. Lord, save us, cried the young ladies, and they put the fire out. Now the tree didn't dare tremble. Oh, that was horrible. It was so afraid of losing any of its decorations. It was altogether dazed by all the brilliance. And now the double doors were opened, and a whole crowd of children rushed in, as if they wanted to upend the whole tree. Their elders followed a bit more sedately. Then the little ones stood quite still, but only for a moment, before they shouted till the room rang and danced around the tree, and one present from another was taken down from it. What are they doing now? thought the tree. What's going to happen? And the candles burnt down to the branches, and after they had done that, everybody put them out, and the children were allowed to plunder the tree. Oh, how they plunged in to do that! so that its branches groaned, and if it hadn't been fixed to the ceiling by the tip, where the gold star was, it would have toppled over. The children danced round with all their lovely toys, and nobody bothered about the tree except for an old nursemaid who came and peered in among the branches, but only to see if anyone had missed a fig or an apple. A story, a story, shouted the children, and pulled a fat little man over to the tree. He sat right down beneath it. Just as if we were in a greenwood, he said, and the tree can have the singular good fortune to hear it as well, but I'm only going to tell one story. Do you want to hear the one about Henny Penny, or the one about Clumper Dumper, who fell downstairs but still rose to be the highest in the land and married the princess? Henny Penny, cried some. Clumper Dumper, cried others, and there was a lot of yelling and shouting. Only the fir tree stayed quite still, thinking, shall I be in it? And the man told the story of Clumper Dumper, who fell downstairs but still rose up to the, be the highest in the land and married the princess. And the children clapped their hands and shouted, Tell it again! Tell it again! And they wanted to have Henny Penny as well, but they only got Clumper Dumper. The fir tree stood there quietly, full of its own thoughts. The birds out in the forest had never told a story like that. Clumper Dumper fell downstairs but still got the princess. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Such things can happen in the world, thought the fir tree, and believed it all true because it was such a nice man who told it. 
Ah, yes, ah, yes, who knows? Perhaps I will fall downstairs too and marry a princess. And it looked forward happily to the next day when it would be decorated with candles and toys and gold and fruit. I won't shiver and shake tomorrow, it thought. I shall really enjoy being so splendid. And what's more, I'll be able to hear the story of Clumper Dumper again tomorrow, and perhaps Henny Penny as well. And the tree stood quiet and thoughtful the whole night long. Next morning, in came men and housemaids. Now, we're back to decorating, thought the tree. But they dragged it out of the room, up the staircase, into the loft, and there they stowed it in a dark corner, away from any chink of daylight. What's the meaning of this, thought the tree. What do you think I'm doing here? What do you think I'll listen to here? And it leaned up against the wall and stood there thinking and thinking. It had plenty of time for this as the days and nights went by. Nobody came up there, and although someone did come eventually, it was only to stow some big tea chests in the corner. The tree was quite hidden, and you'd think it was totally forgotten. It's winter out there now, thought the tree. The earth's hard and covered with snow. The people can't take me out and plant me, so I suppose I'm to shelter here till spring. That's a kindly thought. How very kind these people are. If only it weren't so dark here and so horribly lonely. Not even a little hare. Oh, it was so nice out in the forest with the snow on the ground and the hare jumping past. Yes, even when you jumped over me, although I didn't like it at the time. But up here, it's horribly lonely. Beep, beep, said a little mouse just at that moment and crept forward and another little one followed. They sniffed at the fir tree and crept in amongst its branches. Oh, it's beastly cold, said the little mice. Otherwise it would be a fine place to be. Don't you think so, old tree? Not so much of the old, said the fir tree. There's plenty older than me. Where are you from? asked the mice. And what sort of things do you know about? They were really very inquisitive. Tell us what's the most beautiful place on earth. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been down in the larder where there's cheeses lying on the shelves and hams hanging from the ceiling where you can dance on the tallow candles and go in thin and come out fat? I don't know anything about that, said the tree, but I do know about the forest where the sun shines and the birds sing. And it told them all about its early days and the little mice had never heard anything like that before. And they listened and listened and then they said, Cor, what, a, what you've seen, how happy you must have been. Me? said the fir tree, and it thought about everything it had said. Yes, on the whole, those were pretty good times. But then it told them about that Christmas Eve, when it was hung with sweets and candles. Oh, said the little mice, how lucky you were, you old fir tree. Not so much of the old, said the tree. It was just this winter when that I came out of the forest. I'm absolutely in my prime. It's only that I'm not growing at the moment. What beautiful stories you tell, said the little mice. And the next night they came with four more little mice to listen to the tree, and more of it told them, the more clearly it remembered everything, and it thought, yes, those were pretty good times, but they can come again, they can come again. Clumper Dumper fell downstairs and still married the princess. Perhaps I will marry a princess too. And then the fir tree thought of a pretty little birch tree that grew out there in the forest. And to the fir tree, the birch really seemed like a beautiful princess. Who's Clumper Dumper? asked the little mice. So the fir tree told them the whole story, remembering every single word. And the little mice were ready to jump up to the top of the tree for pure pleasure. And the next night, a great many more mice came along. And on Sunday, even a couple of rats. But they they said the story wasn't much good, and that made the little mice sorry, so that didn't seem so good to them either. Isn't that the only story you know? asked the rat. The only one, answered the tree. I heard it on the happiest night of my life, although at the time I didn't really think how happy I was. It's a remarkably dull story. Don't you know one about bacon or tallow candles or a larder tale? No, said the tree. Well, thanks very much for that, said the rats, and they went back to where they came from. Eventually the mice stayed away too, and the tree sighed. Oh, it was lovely when they all sat around me, those jolly little mice, and listened to what I had to tell. Now that's over and done with. But I'll remember it, to make the most of things when they take me out again. And when will that happen? Well, it was one morning. A lot of people came and rummaged around in the attic. Packing cases were put away, and the tree was pulled out. It's true they shoved it rather roughly over the floor, but a servant dragged it straight away 
to the stairs and out into the daylight. Now life starts all over again, thought the tree, as it felt the freshness of the air, the first rays of the sun, and now it was out in the yard. Everything happened so quickly that the tree forgot to take a look at itself. There was so much to see all around. The yard was next to a garden where everything was in bloom. The roses hung fresh and fragrant over a little trellis. The lindens were in flower and the swallows flew about crying, Tweet, tweet, my old man's back. But they weren't talking about the fir tree. Now I'm coming back to life, it chortled and stretched wide its branches. But ah, they were all withered and yellow. It lay in a corner among the weeds and nettles. The gold tinsel star that was still fixed to its top glittered in the bright sunshine. In the yard itself, a few of the jolly children were playing. The ones who had danced around the tree at Christmas time and enjoyed themselves so much, one of the youngest ran up and pulled off the golden star. See what's sticking to that mucky old Christmas tree, he said, and stamped on its branches so that they cracked under his boots. And the tree looked at the fresh garden in all its coloured splendour, then it looked at itself and wished that it had stayed behind in its dark corner of the loft. It thought about its brisk early days in the forest, about that cheerful Christmas Eve, and about the little mice who had so much enjoyed listening to the story of Clumper Dumper. It's all gone, all gone, said the poor tree. I should have enjoyed myself when I could. All gone, all gone. And the servant came and chopped the tree into small pieces, a whole bundle of them made a fine blaze under the big wash tub, and it sighed deeply so that every sigh was like a little pistol shot. This drew the boys over who were playing there, and they sat around the fire, looked into it and shouted, Piff! Paff! But with every puffing noise that was like a deep sigh, the tree thought of a summer's day in the forest, a winter's night out there under the glittering stars. It thought about Christmas Eve and Clumper Dumper, the only story it had ever heard or knew how to tell. And so the tree was burnt up. The boys played in the yard, and the smallest one had on his chest the gold star which the tree had worn on the happiest evening of its life. Now that was gone, and the tree was gone, and the story too, all gone, all gone. That's the way with all stories.